If you love the Lord, shout amen in this place today. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, King James Version of the Bible, because I like the way it sounds. Jeremiah 18 verse 1 says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. This is Jeremiah talking. Then I went down to the potter's house. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Here's my favorite part. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Thus ends the reading of the word of God. I want to use this for a subject. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God wants to use these next few moments to change your life. Here's what I want you to understand about this text. Here, here's the name of it. Rejection made me. Just look at your neighbor and say, you, you can think whatever you want about me. You can say whatever you want. But it wasn't my degree. It ain't my money. Rejection made me. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> um, throughout history, or the history of this text, as it has been tested and survived exegesis. Most of the attention and emphasis has been put on the fact that Jeremiah got up and went down with an impromptu visit to the potter's house. That's been the substratum of our discussions throughout history as preachers and prognosticators of the gospel. This has been our linchpin. He arose and went to the potter's house, and it should be so. And the potter's house is an important portion of the story. After all, Jeremiah's first command, once according to verse 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to him. The Lord said, Jeremiah, here's what I want you to do, and here's where I want you to go. I want you to get up. And I want you to go down. <laughs> I want you to rise. And then I want you to go down. Seems confusing to me that I have to get up to go down. 
paradox of the statement lets us know right off the bat that we are in for a long ride. The word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And we know, we know according to the text that Jeremiah arises, Elliot, and he goes down to the potter's house. We know that we just read that. We know that to be true. Where it gets a little cloudy is that when he gets there, he sees a potter working at the wheel. And the way the wheel works is there is a pedal that causes the stone to spin. And as he's pedaling, the potter is forming the clay, according to the text, into what pleases him. Let's stop there. There will be no shortage of people who will be disappointed with you because their efforts couldn't shape you. There will be no shortage of people in your life who will curse you and be frustrated with you and it will be because they couldn't shape you. No matter how manipulative they were, no matter how one-sided the conversation was, most of the people who come into your life, not all, but some, are there simply to shape you. So they can get out of you what they need for the moment. Only to be done with you when you decide to reshape yourself. <clears throat> How many of you all are in a reshaping season? Where you recognize that your previous form is not what brought you happiness. Your previous form, you knew in your heart, I'm bigger and better than this. And so he's shaping it. Jeremiah gets there and he sees the potter on the wheel and his attention is arrested. And he stops and he looks in. And I imagine he's peeping through a door or a window and he sees that there is imperfection on the wheel. And he looks in the window and he sees mm, that clay on the wheel, it's disfigured. It's, it's, not, it's not taking shape. And so in an effort to bring the potential out of the clay, are y'all walking with me this morning? The potter, according to the text, throws it down and picks it back up and gives it another chance. You see, because I'm glad that God isn't like man. Because man will throw you away when they can't shape you. But God, in his infinite wisdom, will know who you are and still pick you to do something that other people will think you are not qualified for. Because only man doesn't see the potential of disfiguration. But God is attracted to broken. He's attracted to flawed. He's attracted to mistaken people. Well, that's why if you are perfect and everywhere you've ever gone, everybody just loved you and you were class president, 
prom king, valedictorian, all in the same year. Congratulations. <laughs> this message is for people who just barely got a GED. This is for people who didn't graduate college. You finished when you was finished. Oh, no, no. You just woke up one day and said, you know what? I'm tired of paying these people my money and I ain't learning nothing. I'm done. How many of you got some people who, who graduated? I'm tired, Lottie. I'm just... I'm f if, 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 if you have been accepted everywhere you've gone, I, I got a message for you next week. But this is for the people who spent time on the potter's wheel and still couldn't get it right. This sermon is for people who will hear this sermon today and still might curse when you get to the parking lot. Yeah, I figured I'm talking to you. I'm, don't make me come down there. This is for people, you're going to go home and you say, I'm, I'm tired of drinking, I'm not going to drink, and you're going to take the bottle of liquor and you're going to go to the sink and say, I ain't going to waste my money. I'm just going to leave it up there for decoration. You know, that's the bottle. It's the decoration. <laughs> Somebody shot at the top of the line. I heard you, James. You're crazy. So in essence, on the wheel, he decides to give the clay another chance. Today's message is for people who need another chance. Somebody say, I need another chance. Now, I love Pastor Torrance. I love that part of the story. And trust me, I assure you, we will get back to it. But while you are assembling a message and you have determined to use exegesis as a way of delivery, you can not only pay attention and articulate the text because exegesis says that before you pay attention to the text, you have to go back and research the context. This is why the Bible is often misunderstood because people read the text without consulting the context. Okay, this is going to be a, this is a lesson today. How many of y'all with me? I got time today. I want to teach you something. I promise you this is going to break chains over your life, but I need your attention. I don't need you to rush me. I need you to pay attention. There is something called context and culture that the text is talking to you. But in order to understand the text, you have to go back and find out where is the writer from? Who is the writer talking to? What was the time frame that the writer was writing in? Because the context of all of that will determine how you interpret the text. The text, according to all philosophers that know such uh, we call the word of God the inerrant word of God. Listen, inerrant means not that it doesn't have error. Inerrant means it is incapable of being incorrect. <laughs> the word of God is inerrant. Listen to me. The word of God is, it is incapable of being wrong. Matthew 5 and 18 says, the earth shall pass away, but not one jot or tittle will be misconstrued. In other words, here it is, a jot and a tittle are the smallest, most insignificant letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And God says, my word is so airtight that not even the smallest letter will be missing. 
I paid attention to every detail. I am the God that knows the hairs on your head. I am the God that feeds the sparrow. And if my eye is on the sparrow, then you better know that I am watching over you. I am the God of the details. I made sure that the sun was positioned exactly where it needed to be because if it was closer, you would burn. If it was further, you would freeze. I put the moon in the correct socket to make sure that Earth's gravitational pull would be in concert with the moon. I made sure that the planet were too far for you to get to so that you would be focused on the one that I am. I am the God of the details. Your skin is the color I want it. Your nose is the size that I want it to be. Your lips look like I wanted them to look. You can change them all you want, but I'm the God that made you the way you are. And I also had something that was attracted to what I created you to be. And sometimes you miss what I have for you because you won't be what I made you. <laughs> Slap your neighbor and say, be you. There is something that God put in the earth that likes you and it is looking for you, but it can't find you because you're trying to not be you because you don't like you and God loves you. And so you might as well start to like you. Not one jot or tittle will pass away. Not one. Every word in the scripture is true. So when people say that don't make sense, it's because they read text out of context. I'm going to preach anyway. I'm going to preach anyway. Because context is actually the culture and the time frame. It is geography. It is typography. It is chronology. You have to consult all of those things before you read a verse and say that's exactly what it means. Let me give you a hint. A uh, team, pull up uh, the book of Philippians chapter 4. Let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Let's go to verse 17. I want to read this, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Next verse. But I have all and abound, and I am full, having received of uh, Aphrodite, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Next verse, but my God. Now, you see how we get excited at verse 19? But I'm about to blow your whole house up. Let's go back to verse 17. What you must understand is that at the time Paul wrote Philippians chapter 4, he was in jail, he was in prison, and the church had begun to send him money to put on his books so he can get some commissary. Y'all with me? So, so the church is, because not, I don't desire the gift, but, but I desire the fruit. He says that, that because you're giving to me, here's my prayer, that grace will abound to your account. Go to the next verse. But I have all, and I abound. In other words, y'all have given so much money to my books I can get hot fries, I can get Cheetos, I can get Roman noodles, I can get a slushy, I can get whatever I want, and I received the gifts, and when it got to me, it was a sweet aroma, I was acceptable and well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, here's the context. The people in the church wrote a letter to Paul and said, Paul, we have given you all our money. And Centerpoint is asking, for their money and Reliant is asking for their money and Verizon and AT&T and if you got anybody else I'm praying for you but those two people are asking for their money my car they want their money down at the Jerusalem Audi dealership they're asking me for my money and and they we don't give you all of our money Paul what are we supposed to do here it is Paul says don't worry about it my God shall supply all of your needs so the church has been going around talking about my God shall supply all of my needs but really the only people who can quote verse 19 are the people who have satisfied verse 17 and 18 so if you've never invested in a man of God God ain't supplying so in order to understand text you have to understand 
context. So when people say that verse didn't work for me, it's because they didn't pay attention to the con. So I have chosen exegesis as a model of preaching. But when you don't use context, it's called eisegesis. Exegesis is when you extrapolate from the word of God what it meant. Eisegesis is when you isolate a scripture and try to make it mean what you need it to mean. And the reason why most people don't get the promises of God is because they eisegete the scripture. And they won't exegete, exit, exodus, exegete the strategy. I suffer not a woman to teach a man. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 9. Verse 10, verse 11 says, but every woman should learn in silence. And for history's sake, a lot of preachers have preached that scripture to mean that women should be quiet in church and not preach the gospel. Eisegesis. Not exegesis. Because what was happening at the time that Paul wrote the letter and sent it to Timothy to take to the people, the women were first being allowed into the church for the first time. And so women being inquisitive who have never been able to be in the temple, they were asking all the questions. Oh, Paul, can you explain what you meant by that? Can you explain by that? Paul said, for the moment, all the women, shh. Can I finish my sermon and then I'll take questions? But because we've eisegeted the text, we took what was taking place in one church service in a moment and made it a rule for historicity. But the problem with the scripture is two things. The Bible says in the last days, I'll put my spirit out on your sons and your daughters help me holy ghost and the second thing is if god didn't want women to preach why is it then when he got out of the grave the first person he revealed himself was to a woman and gave her the first sermon go tell my disciples and peter the men will sleep the first sermon of the gospel was preached by a woman Context, not just text. If you're going to read your Bible, you got to know who was talking, when they were talking, who they were talking to. Why did they say that? Is that an epistle? Is it the minor prophet? Is it the major prophet? See, that's why it's so difficult. And I don't recommend that everybody try to preach. Because you got to put a lot of work in to do this. You don't just get up to stand up here and say, Lord, speak to me. No, you have to prepare and hide the word in your heart. You don't get to just stand up here and say, Lord, speak to me. And you haven't prayed to him first. What has happened to preaching is that the bar is low to do it. In every other profession... You got to go get credentials to do it. You don't just get to wake up and say, you know, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I want to do surgery today. You don't get to be a politician without being voted in. You can't just walk into City Hall and say, I'm here. Everybody say context. You'd be surprised how many people are upset with you about what they think you meant. And the problem is you ain't got enough time to go around and explain to every single person why you made every decision. So they have to suffer in silence for years wondering what happened. If you explained yourself to every person who mad at you, you'd never be able to pray. You'd never go to work. You'd never go to sleep. Context. Everybody say context. Y'all got that part? I say, do you have it? The reason why I'm asking you that is because Jeremiah's life has always been focused on the potter's house. But there is something else, Pastor Hammond, that if you don't understand context, you won't understand Jeremiah 18. Because not only was there the potter's house, there was also the potter's field. <laughs> and Jeremiah didn't mention it because there are some dark places in your life you don't have time to talk about. 
Listen, how many of y'all sit next to somebody and you kind of know them, but they don't know all? of what you had to go through to get here. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know this ain't, I'm not going to stay here long, but how many of y'all got some stuff in your life? Even the closest people, you know, there's some pain you don't feel like reliving and explaining and all of that, so you just kind of fast forward and say, you know what, I'm here now. I'm here now, and let's just move on. But how many of y'all got some stuff? A part of the story that you didn't put in the script. Let's talk about Chance. Let's talk about the potter's field. The potter's field where all of the stuff that didn't take shape on the wheel got tossed. All of the rebellious pieces. <laughs> all of the stubborn people, I mean pieces. All of the disgruntled people. <sighs> I keep having this tongue slip. Pieces. Pieces. All of the honorary people, let me drink some tea because these people keep coming out. Pieces. Guy yelled, all of, all of the people who don't tell me how to live my life, he put his pants on one leg at a time like me. Well, ain't no different than me. All of the pieces that wouldn't take shape ended up in the potter's field. And let's talk about the potter's field because there were a whole lot more pieces in the field than made it into the potter's house. In the field were the unclaimed pe pieces. In the field. Can I just say people? So I don't have to keep lying to y'all. People. All of the pieces and people with broken dreams. The potter's field where, where you go when you give up. You know that place you go when somebody you love didn't love you back? You, you know how you hide when it didn't work the way you intended it to work? You, you, know, you know where we all go when we get embarrassed. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? That, that space where you hide from reality because it becomes too difficult to face. And you come to church and you say, I am a child of God. But on Monday, you go right back to wondering if he really loves you. And, 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 and how every other month you question your salvation and wonder, am I really saved? Does he really, really love me? Because I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I thought this thing was going to feel when I accepted him. I, I don't have the courage that I thought I was going to have when I got in that church and I got on the potter's wheel. So I'm out here in the field. And Acts 1 and 19 says that the field of Jerusalem was actually called the field of blood. In other words, there was a place where I am leading, but I am still bleeding. You'd be surprised how many bleeding parents are in this room. You'd be surprised how many people have 5,000 square foot homes and $10,000 mattresses and can't even go to sleep. You'd be surprised how many people have food in the refrigerator and don't have an appetite. You'd be surprised how many people have a thousand dollar pair of glasses with no vision. You'd be surprised how many people have three cars in the garage and nowhere to go. And a house big enough to throw a party but no friend to invite. You'd be surprised how many rich failures there are. Because you look at people and they got stuff and you think that means success. Oh, I know some rich failures. Why? Because failure, watch what happens. He looks at the clay and when it doesn't become what he intended, the only way the clay ends up in the field is when it doesn't please the potter. Not the people. 
the potter. You don't get thrown away because you don't meet our expectation. You get thrown away because you don't meet his expectation. And then God gave me the definition of failure. Failure is when you don't become what he intended you to be. Some of you all make eight, seven, six figures a year, and you're a failure. Being rich don't make you successful. Are you listening to me? I don't care how much your car costs. I don't care how much your bag costs. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. If you are not doing what God created you to do, you are failing. The two jobs of the clay, the purpose of the pot, was to contain and to pour. Imagine this is ceramic. Imagine this is clay. This cup has two jobs. Contain what's put in it and pour. Aren't we made of clay? You got two jobs. <laughs> to hold what he gave you and find somebody to pour it into. And if you're not containing and pouring, you are failing. God didn't give you that gift to just get rich. He gave you that gift to pour it into somebody else. I need somebody to shout out. I need to get into my pouring season. Because you are not going to be blessed until you find a way to be a blessing. You are not going to be blessed until you find a way to multiply what you have inside of you. You've got to pour it out. You got two jobs. Not make money but contain and pour. Most people suffer from selfishness because we don't like to pour. We don't like to pour. We don't like to give. All we can think about is keeping it, but let me tell you something. When you don't pour, you are a marred vessel. Man, this sermon ain't good enough, I can tell. This sermon ain't good enough. Let's see. You see, I'm, I promise you that those of you all who get this, your life is going to exponentially change. Somebody say contain and pour. Right now, I am putting the word in you, and right now you got to contain it, but you got to get somewhere where you can find somewhere to pour it on and make sure you pour it in the right place because you cannot give your pearls. What makes you disfigured to God is that you're not doing what he created you to do. Your job ain't your purpose. He's using your job to finance your purpose so you can get to the place where you can pour out what he gave you. I have done this job that you see me doing right now for free. I worked years before I ever was compensated to preach the gospel. Because he put it in me. And I poured it when I had five members over the age of 72 when I was 21 years old and they were all falling asleep in the church. And I poured it when our church was in a laundromat and I poured it when we did not have heat in the building and I poured it when we had a flood in the basement so high that the water came up through the second floor and I poured it when I drove a 1996 Buick Regal with a cracked head gasket to church every Sunday morning and I poured it when on Easter Sunday we had 30 people in the building and overflow and that's because 12 of them was pregnant and I'm not lying to you, we had 30 people, including the babies inside the mothers. And I poured it when they came to me and said, Pastor, we can do better. We can give you $50 a week. And I poured when I got my first raise after a year and six months to $250 a week. Oh, I was balling then too, cuz. You can't tell me I wasn't balling. I got me a Chrysler 300, got me some spinners. They were spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, looking like a fool. Talking about it looked like a, a Rolls Royce until one pulled up. 
Like Cat Williams said, a, a 300 looked like a 300 when the Rolls Royce and Bentley do pull up. And here I am in 2022 with what God has given us. And now my problems are not members. We got them everywhere. Now I got to survive the rumors. But I got to keep on. As our church grows and I got to make decisions on things that people don't like, but I got to still come up here and poor, why they sitting out there looking at me now? Like this. But I see you, and I'm gonna keep on preaching because I'm a poorer. I see you every Sunday with your attitude, but I still poor. I am not blind nor stupid. I see you. But I poor. Why? Because I don't want to end up in the field with you. And if you don't understand that your attitude and your inability to be shaped has you in the field, I want to talk to people and say, I don't want to be in the field. I want to be in the house. Somebody shout, I want to be in the house. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for. Don't you allow your rigidness to make you end up in the field. If you don't take shape, you will be discarded into the field because if he can't use you to pour, he has no use for you. Somebody shout, I'm a pourer. How many of y'all gonna let God shape you this year? Okay. If I'm helping you, holler at me. Okay. Because I know, I know I'm challenging you, but this is, this is going to work. Um, have you ever known anybody to break something and they didn't get it fixed properly and so it healed improperly? And then they have to go back to the doctor and it has to be broken because sometimes you can think you're fixed. But in order to be fixed right, you had to be set first. See, some people did too much healing without first being set. And so now you healed in a disfigured place and you still have mobility, but it is discomfortable. Because you healed wrong. What do I mean by healing wrong? Just getting over it. What do I mean by healing wrong? I'm just, I'm just, you know what? It is what it is, and, and I'm just going to let it be what it's going to be. I ain't going to say nothing. I'm just going to get along and get along. Healing wrong. But if you're ever going to pour, you might have to be broken. Set again. I was talking to Pastor Hammond. I didn't know his daughter played basketball. She tore ACL. We had something in common. I start talking to him about her recovery, like, Lauren, do this, do that, do that. And, and they found out that she could not lift her heel. See, one of the tests when you tear your ACL is you have to lift your heel to your butt. If you can't touch that, then they know you've lost mobility. So what they had to go in and do is tear out the scar tissue, another surgery through the same holes, because something didn't heal right, preventing her from having full flexibility. You see, because sometimes you can heal wrong and lose your movement. And what does God have to do? He has to go back in and start anew. And I think that there are some people in here and watching me online, you are in the recycle system. God has given you another chance to get yourself together. Okay, they hurt you. Moving on. Okay, they misunderstood your motive. Move on. Okay, you didn't get the apology that you were expecting. But if you're expecting an apology from somebody and you won't be happy until they give it to you, you've just given them control of your life.
I have determined that neither death nor life, nor things present and nor things to come, shall separate me from the love of God. If I'm helping you, holler at me real quick. <clears throat> Can I tell you something? So I want you to imagine that the potter has to go out into the field, take his shovel, and get some clay. Take it back. Where is he taking it? To the house. He makes a wheel, puts the vessel on there, works, puts it on the shelf. It's beautiful. He's got to go back to the field and get what? Some more clay. Boom. Takes it where? To the house, puts it on the wheel, makes it. Boom. Where's he got to go? And then makes another. Eventually, he goes to the same place so many times that now there's a hole. Now, this is why I gave you context, because there's something called the potter's field. In those days, the potter's field actually served as a cemetery for people who could not afford to be buried. So for the people who could not be in the Orthodox cemetery, they ended up in a hole that the potter dug. Can I give you a word? Every demon, every witch, every warlock, every person against your destiny that has ever dug into you and made a hole, God told me to tell you, that the hole they made in you is about to be their grave. Oh, I wish I had somebody. You ain't got to get even. You ain't got to fight. The next time an enemy takes a jab at you, look at him and say, you digging your own grave. I wish I had about 500 people who would understand that God is a rewarder of those. I can't get excited today. This ain't that day. Don't do that to me. Every time they take a stab at you, every time they take a dig at you, they're digging their own grave. And don't you get in the way, otherwise you'll end up in it with them. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Them people on your job that keep bothering you, just let them keep digging at you. Those family members that won't, just let them keep digging at you. Those haters online, just let them keep, they are digging their own grave. Everything that comes up against you shall be buried. If you let him shape you, if you will become what he created you to be, he will deal with that which is digging into you. Are you listening to me? Sit down, I ain't finished. Because I don't need you leaving here thinking that's the end of the story. This is the whole story. How many of you will admit that you have not become all that he is trying to get you to be yet. I'm not talking about being successful. Please don't, don't cheapen this word. I'm talking about like some of us, like you know how you, you were born in a house 
where everybody was negative and now you're fighting negativity and every once in a while you feel yourself kind of You know how sometimes you could be raised in a home where, where, where yelling was used as a tool and, and, and you know that you don't want to yell so, so you find yourself, but every once in a while. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. You know how you grew up feeling insecure and, and, and rejected. She didn't know the rejection was making you. What if the people who didn't deserve you got you? You wouldn't have been available when God came to seek you. You didn't know that God had you rejected where you wanted to be. So you could be available where you should be. And you looked at it as rejection. Where would David have been if he was his father's favorite child? Not Israel. Sometimes rejection is protection. Baby, do you remember if you read the story, there is a story about Jesus uh, on a donkey on Palm Sunday. How many of y'all remember that? And the Bible says that they were throwing palms on the ground and they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. How did he get there? The Bible says he rode on a donkey that had never, say it again, that had never been ridden before. That means that every person who was looking for a donkey overlooked him. And he was tied up in the street without an owner. And it took God to come and see the potential of the donkey that everybody had walked past. You don't understand that God let them overlook you so he can ride in on you. And he's going to get the glory. Somebody shout God's going to get the glory out of my life. Help me Holy Ghost. I'm trying to get done. I swear to you, I'm trying to let you go, but I feel, I feel we're on the verge of a boiling point. And I know some of y'all are ready to go, and we ain't locking you in here. You can walk out, but folks who want deliverance, can you watch with me but one hour? For the dysfunctional and the disappointed, and the disapproved. Oh, and the dyslexic. Whatever dis you've had to deal with. For the dissatisfied. Help me, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. For the disabled. For the disgraced. God told me to tell you. That he will allow dysfunction. But he will not allow no function. You. Have to get to work. I don't care what you've been through. Get your butt up and do something. Get up and do something. I don't care how broken your heart is. Get up and do something. I don't care how insecure you feel. Get up and do something. I don't care how many lies they told on you. Get up. Arise and go down. To the potter's house. Touch your neighbor and say, get up. Get out of your depression. Get out of your stupor. Get out of your insecurity. 
Rejection is making you get out of your pity party. Get over yourself. Get out of your feelings and get up and do something. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. I feel deliverance in the room. Tell somebody you got to do something. Here's what Matthew 7 and 19 says. He says, every tree that does not bear fruit, cut it down and throw it into the fire. No function is failure, not dysfunction. At least you are trying to do something. A man that don't work? Basically, God's saying, if you ain't doing nothing, starve. Just starve. I feed function. It could be wrong, but at least you're trying. Can't pay you to lay in the bed all day. With the curtains drawn closed, feeling sorry for yourself because your daddy didn't raise you. You're not the only one whose father was not present in their life. The difference was is you used it to stay still. Somebody else used it to move forward. Choose ye this day. Yo, trouble ain't no excuse. Your trauma ain't either. Somebody shout, set me free. You ain't been through nothing nobody else has been through. Everybody in here got struggles. It's rained on all of us in this place. Do something with your life. Make something of yourself. It's a sin to be good when he created you to be great. How can you not pour and you have been in the hands of the potter? He shaped you. He touched you. A basketball in my hand is worth $25. Put it in Steph Curry's hand, it's worth $45 million a year. All because of who touched it. You don't know how valuable you are because you're looking at what they said about you. You are valuable because of who touched you. Do something! In spite of how you feel. In spite of what it looks like. Stay on that wheel. Don't give up. Don't give in. It's only a test. Are you hearing me? I said, did you hear me? Fight. He who has began a good work in you will establish it until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't get off that wheel until it's time. Stay in the race until you reach your destiny. No excuses. Fight. Fight. After having done all the stand, keep on standing. Are you hearing me? I don't care who divorced you, stand up. I don't care who abused you, get up. I don't care who lied on you, stand your butt up. I don't care who fired you, start the company anyway. your season rejection is making you and you got to accept it as part of the process be not weary in well doing 
for you will reap a harvest if you don't get off this wheel. Can I tell you something? Stand up, I'm done. Every person you admire used to be broken. He said, oh, Oprah Winfrey, richest black woman, pregnant at 14. Discarded by her family. Adopted. Barack Obama, he's our president, abandoned by his father. Raised in different climates and at some point no sense of self-identity. Show me a master, I'll show you who used to be a disaster. <laughs> Michael Jordan, the greatest player of all time in somebody's opinion, yeah, but he found his father dead on the side of a road. You ain't gonna get there without a cost. It's gonna cost you something. But you gotta keep going. You gotta fight. You can't give up that easy. Not when the potter's touched you. Every vessel that's on the shelf used to be broken. And I know, I know when you get married, you're looking for somebody perfect, but you just, you just really married somebody broken. I, the, the, the best thing, we were in premarital counseling with Bishop Jakes. He looked at me and said something I wish I would have known 20 years ago. He looked at me and said this, Sister Walker. He said, the problem with most people is when they get married, they think the person's life started the day they met them. But let me tell you something. When you get married to somebody, you marry in the whole story. Now you upset about something they're doing today, you don't understand that that's behavior that's been modeled in their life for 15, 20 years. So before you say, I do, can you go get the whole story? Rejection made me. I fight because I always had to. Demon, I don't know a time in my life where I didn't have to claw. I literally have been fighting for 40 years. I have had to fight for everything. Just wasn't my life to be given anything for free. For some people it was. That ain't what he made me for. He, he made me to fight. I've just recently learned in my life that a man with only one tool can never do the job. You got to find out another way to accomplish your goals, to get results. <laughs> if rejection has surrounded your life, I just want you to show me your hand so I can know who I'm ministering to. It's okay. Because the Bible says that Jesus was the rejected stone. And that was a part of his destiny. Because the writer later says that the rejected stone became the chief cornerstone. And it does not matter how you start. It matters how you finish. And God told me to tell you, your ladder shall be greater. The second part of your life will make you forget the first part of your life. 
Listen, my final word to you is this final blessing over your life. Brother Reggie, may the worst days of your future still be better than the best days of your past. Somebody say, I receive it. Oh, you about to have more than you ever had. You about to go further than you've ever gone. Your name is about to be called great. City officials are gonna know who you are. At the snap of a finger, you're gonna be able to make moves. God is gonna send you clients that you didn't expect. Your name about to mean something. So lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Everybody lift your head up. This ain't arrogance, this is posture. I'm not arrogant, I just know who I am. You see this baby here? I just love her. She's, y'all give her a hand. She's a new member of our music team. She's 16. She's 16 years old. And we had, they, we had this rule. Remember, Will, we had this rule. We was talking about, oh, you, you want to make sure that before you put them on the team, they got to be a certain age and all that kind of stuff. So I put them all through an aptitude test, and she outscored all them grown folks. She, she, this baby here. And it's not a slight. It's an advantage because a child shall lead them. See, sometimes the problem is, is we bring our adult mentality to problems we should bring our childish behavior to. The reason why she scored the highest is because she's not finished being shaped. Y'all missing what I'm trying to say. She's still moldable. She's still malleable. She can still be influenced. Sometimes grown people fail because they're set in their ways. And I encouraged her Monday rehearsal. So I said, baby, just stay just the way you are. And I want you all to make sure that you take care of her. Because music can be brutal. Music can be brutal. It can do things. Ministry can be brutal. It can do things to you. But if you just stay on the wheel. Sooner or later. God going to do? He's going to me. it won't always be like God will, God will, God will perfect and me. Sooner or later, sooner or later, it's going to turn. If you're in this place today, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. If you're watching online and you don't know him with the pardon of your sins, we do this because the Bible says the Lord will not come back until every man and every woman, every child has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this message is meeting you somewhere, somewhere in a town, a hamlet, a hut, someplace off the beating path, that the word of God is penetrating to where you are, letting you know that he lives. And because he lives, you can face tomorrow. If you're in this place today, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. If you're in line, they're getting ready to put instructions up on the screen. This is the time where we come out of our seat and boldly come to the throne of grace, expressing a need for Jesus Christ in our lives. If you're in this place, you've never accepted Christ, or you don't go to church, or want to make sure that this is the place where you grow and are trained in the Word of God, I want you to come out of that seat because our care counselors are waiting on you. Where are, where are you? Wherever you are. This is the time where you come. And as they say, the doors of the church are open. I say that they've never been closed since Jesus Christ got out of that grave. They stay open. God bless you, my sister. Come on, make, make, make it real big, Lighthouse, as they come. God bless you. Sooner or later, it's going to turn in my Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. God bless you, my brother. Come on, Lighthouse, make it a big deal.